In this episode, we'll take a look at the new dynamic dehum feature in Isotope RX9. First up, this dehum module is available in RX9 Standard and Advanced. It is not available in the Elements version, but if you would like to learn about some of the other plugins in the Elements version, be sure to check out our channel where we have a variety of different Isotope RX lessons. First up, let's go ahead and play back a sample with a rather disturbing hum. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that 2 and 2 made 4, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Okay, let's go ahead and switch over to the spectrogram view. That's down here in the lower left-hand corner. We're just going to go ahead and slide that all the way to the right. What this does is give us a view of the different frequencies that are represented at different points in time. So along the x-axis here we have time. On the y-axis we have frequencies with the low frequencies or base frequencies down here at the bottom and the higher frequencies up here at the top. You can see these horizontal lines. Those represent, or those are indicators, that we have a hum problem. You can see there are a whole bunch of them. And they extend up pretty far. In fact, uh, well up into the 3 kilohertz range at least, and perhaps even beyond that up into 5 kilohertz. So there are a few considerations. Let's go ahead and first open up our dehum module. When you come in, you can see there are two different filter types. There's dynamic, which is the new one we're going to talk about, and there's also the classic static version. Now, this version has been in RX for a long time. It's actually quite effective if you have a fairly simple type of hum. Say, for example, a fundamental frequency at which the hum occurs, and maybe a few harmonics above that. This one, however, is a little bit more complicated. You can see all of these horizontal lines. And for example, if I went into adaptive mode here, let's go ahead and do a preview and you can hear what it does. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty and yet you are quite sure of the fact. So in this case, not only does it not remove most of the hum, but it also makes this sort of ringing sound when the dialogue is playing. So it not only doesn't clean up the problem, it also creates some additional problems when it comes to dialogue and other source sounds that you are trying to keep. So let's go ahead and hop over to the dynamic version. This one's pretty straightforward. There are not a lot of controls. There's a learn button. So whenever there's a learn button, that means you have to select a sample area. So in this case, of course, we'd want to choose somewhere where the hum exists, but there isn't any dialogue or any other of the source sounds. And then what we can do from there is click Learn. So it's learned the hum profile in that case. Now we have a few other controls here. We have sensitivity. This is how much hum it's going to remove. If you bump it up to 10, it's going to try and remove more hum. If you bump it down uh, to these lower numbers here, of course, it will try and reduce less of the hum. The default setting is 5, and I typically recommend starting there. Bands refers to how many notch filters it's going to use. So the way that this works when you're dehumming is you actually create these filters that filter out certain frequencies. And in this case, it tells you how many different bands it's going to use. The default is 128. If you have a lot of hum, even up here into the higher frequencies, you might need to use more bands. But I generally recommend start with 128, and you can always add more if you need to. Filter Q is essentially telling the dehum how wide to make each of these notch filters. Now the default setting is 1000, but you can also drop that down if you want to, or bump it up if you need to. So if you need to use wider filters, you might drop it down, or if you want to use narrower filters, bring it up. Again, I would recommend start with 1000 and see how that goes for you, adjust from there. You also have these controls here, which are essentially low pass and high pass filters. So here's the high pass filter. So essentially, as I move this up, for example, here, that would say, don't apply the filter below 520 Hertz. And likewise, if you use this control here, don't apply the filter anywhere above, in this case, 13,121 Hertz. So normally I would leave those 
out at the edges so that you get the entire spectrum. Okay, let's go ahead and now do a preview and see how this sounds. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Wow. Let's go ahead and render that just so we can see visually how it changes the audio. You can see now a lot of those horizontal lines have disappeared. And the dialogue didn't change a whole lot. It did affect some in here. And it, as you listen back, there may be a tiny bit of artifacting, but overall it did a really nice job. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Okay. Now, it didn't remove the rest of the fan noise and maybe the other compressor noises, but it did take care of the hum and some of the buzz as well. So that's a really good thing. Now, the first question you might ask yourself, well, what if I don't have a full five seconds like we had here? <laughs> and oftentimes you don't really have that much. So I'm going to go ahead and undo. Let's just select one second. So if I go from 3.5 seconds to 4.5 seconds, let's learn. And then let's go ahead and apply it and see how it sounds this time. Visually, it looks like it did a good job. Let's listen. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Not quite as well, but still very, very good, given the very small sample we had. Now, one other thing that's important to keep in mind with RX is that you can actually select multiple areas. So, for example, if I had a second here and maybe another second over here, I just hold down the shift key while I select some additional time. And maybe I had another second uh, somewhere over here, something like that. Let's go ahead and learn the profile now and deselect and go ahead and render. Now we'll listen back. It was easier to know it than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact. Okay, not bad. Not probably as good as the five second sample, but still quite good. So I think the lesson here is that the more sample you can select before you click learn, the better off the algorithm will do at removing that hum. So there's an overview of how the new dynamic dehum works in Isotope RX Standard and Advanced. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you have not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.